Hello, everyone. My name is David Ader, and I work for the University of Tennessee. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about our project, which is in Cambodia. Um, and our project we call Scaling Suitable Sustainable Technologies, or S3. So there's a pressing need in Cambodia to increase the diversification of small farms. Um, this is in order to improve human nutrition through more balanced diets, but it's also to create new income streams. Um, a challenge to diversifying smallholder systems is to develop useful and gender appropriate technologies to address the temporal, the spatial, and the functional components of a sustainable system. Um, in phase one of SIL, we examined household characteristics, socioeconomic conditions, and prevalent agricultural practices so that we could identify um, sustainable intensification technologies that are suitable for smallholders and have high potential to sustainably increase income um, and improve nutrition. So the scaling sustainable, scaling suitable sustainable technology, or just S3, um, will support Cambodians farmers and hopefully scale sustainable technologies to reach 10,000 farmers. Um, and we're going to employ gender and ecologically sensitive impact pathways that we mapped during phase one um, and to advance the capacities and, and the roles of scaling agents, to help diffuse technology uh, through applying research, through technical assistance, curriculum development, and organizational strengthening. Um, this process demonstrates that there's potential for scaling technology through local, national, and regional networks um, and for its uptake, uh, the uptake of technologies by farmers. And so we're hoping to serve as a regional model of self-reliance. Using the SI assessment framework, we were able to see across different domains that not only that these various technologies influence, influence groups differently, um, but how trade-offs exist, especially when scaling. Um, and thinking about the diversification of the system, we have to think about addressing the temporal and the spatial and the functional um, diversity of crops. So this is within this larger context of working with farmers as participatory agents, uh, their stakeholders in this process, uh, increasing their networks and market linkages and providing institutional and policy support. Um, by adopting these technologies, whether they're individually or all of the technologies in, in conjunction with one another, this enables farmers to sustainably intensify their systems compared to just conventional practices. Um, there's a critical need, for example, of cover cropping. Um, cover cropping is the use of additional species um, in order to protect soil and, and improve fertility. Um, and this need for cover crops is particularly prevalent after rice. Um, a lot of rice growers in Cambodia and a lot of the time after they harvest their rice, they just leave the fields um, vacant for a number of months, uh, particularly it's because it's the dry season, but there are things that they can do to use that and intensify that production system. Um, so we've been working with partners uh, in, in Cambodia, particularly the Ministry of Agriculture, forestry and fisheries, with CRAD, with CSANE as well, and their station in Kampong Cham. Um, and so during phase one, we worked with them to trial the use of the mixes of the cover crop species, like, like Crotillaria that we showed, um, but all, a number of different species. And this is to show how they can be used after rice, um, but also other systems like after cassava or after maize. Um, and we worked closely with the, these partners to improve the capacities of key operators in Cambodia to produce and disseminate uh, this diversity of cover crops. Um, also other, other species of underutilized species that are of primary interest when trying to create a, a more ecologically sensitive or more agroecological system. Um, so phase one research really focused on cover croppings for the purposes of soil fertility improvement. Um, also as like a multifunctional species. So not only protecting and, and making your, certal, your, fer, your, your soil more fertile, um, but also could be a source of fodder for cattle um, or just seed production as like a secondary crop. Um, large amounts of biomass can be used in this way. And so it's something that we really need to look for and how to scale. Um, a second critical innovation would be looking at um, vegetable production and how we can improve vegetable production throughout the, the dry season. 
in the wet seasons, these different seasonal demands. Um, we also, for example, the rainy season production, tomatoes is really difficult to produce, a lot of flooded waterlogged soils, a lot of nematodes and soil borne diseases. And so a large majority of vegetables consumed during the wet period would be imported, um, can be expensive. Um, and so we looked at during phase one, how do you how do you identify top performing tomato and eggplant combinations? So you're actually cutting tomatoes and eggplants and growing them together, tomato on top of eggplant rootstock. And that's just one example. There's lots of other different types of grafting um, combinations. And so looking at how to do that and, and teaching about these, these combinations. And so we have a team of uh, key collaborators that were trained and became very proficient in vegetable grafting. And so they've been working with farmers, NGOs, across Cambodia in order to train different people in basic grafting techniques. And this, this is laying a, a broad foundation for, for future work in this phase two about scaling up vegetable grafting as a technology. Because uh, production of grafted plants or the production of, of tomatoes from these plants represents a suitable and scalable or sustainable technology for farmers, particularly women farmers, as they're the ones most often responsible for vegetable production. Has a high potential for increased income via more market engagement as well as improved household nutrition. And finally, a critical innovation we like to call wild gardens, but it's more of an assemblage of, of wild food plants. So we've conducted extensive wet season and dry season inventories in the markets to see which types of wild food plants were present. So our surveys documented over 40 different species of uh, wild food plants with a, with a strong market pull. And so that's critical to uh, the sustainability of a system. Um, and so we conducted extensive farm surveys as well and interviews with farmers to look at their use of these wild food plant species at a household level and in the village. And so the, their responses showed us that uh, they, these groups of wild food plants, these wild gardens, they play a significant role in the household farming system. So families use these wild food plants in a variety of ways, um, household consumption, medicinal purposes, uh, and they also use it to generate income. And so we looked at in phase one, a number of these species and of their production, but we also looked at their nutritional benefits. Um, and so our data indicates that certain species are, are high in key vitamins and minerals and can be useful tools for looking at malnutrition, particularly with children. So our assessment at this point points to that wild gardens are appropriate and useful sustainable technology for certain smallholders in Cambodia. And it addresses all of these different aspects of like temporal diversification and different access or different areas of space and the different functions that crops have. Um, so really our goal for the second phase is to scale these technologies and take them to a large number of farmers and get them into the hands of farmers to improve their, their outcomes and their livelihoods. Um, so looking at that, we're looking at our objectives, but our first objective really is um, to take what we've learned in phase one um, and kind of addressing the barriers that we found to participation in the horticultural value chains. Um, so we're going to focus on like livelihood strengthening and particularly with objective one is the market integration. Um, looking at how these technologies can be more implemented uh, with a, as a market pathway. So these activities support uh, taking all the technologies to scale them through the private sector, taking a private sector integrated approach. Um, we're working with CRAD as well as Swiss contact and other scaling agents. Um, and we want to strengthen the participation of women's groups and, and other, other farming groups and cooperatives. Um, and these agents will, will help provide training and, and inputs to groups to, to help establish uh, nurseries and integrating cover crops into, into systems, um, as well as using you know, uh, technologies for, for different seasonal production of vegetables. So working through the private sector, our project uh, is going to support develop uh, support the development of business plans, looking at uh, plant nurseries, um, and marketing uh, and also the marketing of horticultural production. Um, particularly Swiss Contact, with their years of experience working with the private sector, um, they're going to help us by supporting some of the seed companies that exist to help bring some of these cover crop seed mixes to market. Um, product development is really guided by ongoing research into um, the, the technologies themselves and, and the participatory evaluation of, of producers and input suppliers and, and users of these technologies. Um, so for example, development of plant nursery businesses and commercial seed producers can help provide access to germplasm for other producers. 
and also working in, in a partnership with the appropriate scale mechanization consortium, uh, looking at, at mechanization and how do we apply some of the small scale mechanization possibilities um, with farmers to help them in the preparation of fields or how to manage these new cover crop species or even planting of, of lo large amounts of graft vegetables. Uh, and these technologies can be promoted uh, with support of the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries because their strategic development plan talks about diversifying and modernizing the agricultural sector. So it's helping to support um, their goals as well. Um, students also present a, a nice entry point um, to extend new technologies to farm families. Uh, we demonstrated this a little bit in phase one, but there's evidence from other countries, uh, even in the US, we have a, a long going decades old um, 4-H program. It's a youth program to engage youth in agriculture. So under this objective, uh, S3 will focus on looking at what we call green labs or basically school gardens to provide experiential learning opportunities and to promote agricultural entrepreneurship. So our project will engage youth in these opportunities, uh, really hands-on learning opportunities at these, these green labs um, at the high schools. And so students will receive a combination of training um, in sustainable intensification practices, but also just in basic STEM-based instruction, science, technology, and engineering, and mathematics. So it's sort of sometimes we call that a STEM or STEM, you can even do STEM plus agriculture. Um, and so incorporating STEM-based instruction into the curriculum. Uh, this, this objective can culminate in the establishment of student gardens as well. So school gardens and taking the information from the school gardens and having the students apply that to a home garden. So because, you know, because the demonstration gardens at schools can act as a, a way to evaluate new practices before families apply them into their own fields. Uh, objective three, we will strengthen the, the capabilities and the self-reliance of Cambodian and regional partners by helping to build research capacity, their extension capacity, and also just education capacity. Um, we have the CSANE tech parks. Uh, we will have these green labs uh, established at the schools. And these serve as sort of on-station research sites uh, for participatory research with farmers, uh, particularly students. And we can leverage other programs that exist in, in, the, in this way. Um, one particular program that we plan on leveraging is the USAID's Farmer to Farmer program. So the Farmer to Farmer program in Cambodia is, is also managed by the University of Tennessee. And as myself as being a part of that, that project, um, we're helping to, to make sure that the, the volunteers that are working with Farmer to Farmer are helping to engage with um, our partners there under S3. Um, and also we want to help strengthen the capacity um, of not all, all of our partners in the region and the ones we work with, but, but all, you know, within, within Cambodia, but also hopefully within the Southeast Asia region. Um, you know, bringing together national partners and regional partners and, and having meetings and innovation platforms can help build on, on sort of the existing work that people are doing. One of the problems that we find is that there's a lot of different organizations and a lot of different work happening in Cambodia, but it, you, you really have to take the time to, to communicate and to find out what other people are doing as to learn, to learn from each other. Um, and so we'll be able to work together um, and, and hopefully co-host some conferences and, and build on each other's work and, and, and uh, develop, co-develop some strategies to help in scaling out regionally. Um, you know, these kinds of opportunities present venues and, and chances for us to almost have a train, of, train the trainer kind of a model where participants can receive instruction and teaching resources about these technologies and hopefully they can disseminate that through their own networks as well. Um, so we want to look at a couple of different pathways for, for our project, this phase two. Um, so like I mentioned, our, our, our first pathway is the private sector engagement pathway. Um, and we're looking to strengthen the participation of farmers, particularly, particularly women groups uh, in these local value chains for horticultural foods. So our project will engage scaling partners to provide necessary skills and tools and market linkages to increase production, but it also to expand into new markets. Um, this is going to be supported by improving the access to germplasm 
Um, it's really hard to grow cover crops if there's no cover crop seeds available, for example. So S3 will partner with CRAD, Swiss Contact, and other partners like Echo Asia um, to look at innovative financing and to strengthen the participation of smallholder farmers in these vegetable wild food plants and cover crop value chains. Um, but when we promote linkages of smallholder cooperatives and enterprises, um, it, it helps to think about how that happens and, and what, are, what are sort of the constraints to, to getting that message out there um, and how do you promote those linkages. And so, you know, working with our partners on the ground who have a lot of experience uh, looking at the private sector and these markets in the different markets, um, we're going to try to take these three technologies um, and, and come up with strategies to improve their, their private sector, not only access for, for farmers to engage in the private sector, but also looking for the existing private sector to invest um, in building these regional markets. So by doing things like conducting a SWOT analysis of the recent and current efforts to promote scaling of technologies, um, you know, we can look at what's already been going on. What, what's, so what's happening in the private sector with these technologies? And there's a lot of relevant, relevant examples, recent examples that we can look at. Um, and you know, by collecting this information, uh, and reviewing these different examples of, of recent uh, recent engagement in the private sector, um, and combining that with you know focus groups and interviews with inf key informants that are that are involved, we're hoping to uh, you know gather up and validate some findings that uh, our partners can implement. Um, particularly, we can share with each other during some of these some of these regional uh, regional events. So the strategy we have for private sector engagement is based on a combination of demand creation and technology promotions. Positive impact through the market system uh, can be achieved by working with the knowledge of the market system and opportunities and constraints that are associated. So Swift Contact is going to lead up a lot of activities that are targeting these uh, intervention areas, um, trying to promote high value rainy season vegetables, promoting the adoption of wild food plants as a farm diversification tool, and promoting the use of cover crops to, uh, and also to improving the access to, to seeds and distribution. Um, but we're looking also how we're, we do these things in partnership with other USAID funded programs like ASMC um, to look at the machineries and the types of machineries that are needed when you're trying to, to improve these types of technologies and these uh, types of, of, of agricultural practices. So, um, Swiss Contact's also helping to work on an inclusive growth strategy, which is a plan to have an inclusive, uh, an inclusive market approach and help to create a market map of the various actors that are involved. And then by carrying out some field investigations, we can add findings to a market analysis and sort of build on what is currently being done, particularly under programs like Harvest, the USAID Harvest 2 program. Um, this provides some synergies between our projects and other, uh, uh, other projects that support smallholders. Uh, working with the Ministry of Education, Youth and Sport, um, and also, you know, in the secondary schools that they run. Our second pathway would be working with youth and engage in an educational uh, pathway to engage youth in experiential learning opportunities at school gardens. Um, and so our counterparts, we have the University, the National University of Battambang and the Royal University of Agriculture um, and, and other, other smaller uh, more provincial universities and agricultural schools. Um, but these partners can help us with training and, and equipping instructors at the high schools to, uh, to engage with the students in, um, in STEM-based instruction and principles uh, and, and participatory research experience uh, to promote sustainable intensification technologies. Students can apply this experience uh, in, the, in, the, in the school garden and also in the design of a home garden. Um, which could come with the exchange of germplasm. So it's hard to plant things at home if you don't have the things to plant. And this is modeled after a 4-H program in, in, in various countries. Um, and these, these labs help position students as the scaling agents themselves. Um, and they're the ones that transfer the sustainable intensification practices back to the village and back home. Um, and we, you know, we're trying to work with other regional partners like CERCA uh, who has a school plus home garden program and curriculum developed for that. And by sort of adopting some of the practices and lessons that they've already learned, um, we can apply that to our, our project and, and even have some virtual exchanges with, with actors across the region. Um, so really the, our whole point is to scale via the private sector and via the educational sector 
to reach as many farmers as we can to help them have improved technology. Um, so our plan towards sustainability is by really by focusing on the market engagement, um, we're hoping to provide more sustainable business opportunities. So if farmers aren't making any money, um, it's difficult for them to adopt a technology. Right? And if it, if it takes more time and it's more expensive and they're not getting a return on that investment, it, it makes it more difficult. So by thinking about how farmers are engaged in the market um, really is a, is a, a step towards um, more sustainable businesses in a longer term, longer running program, long, longer term impacts. Um, but also by engaging with the educational sector, we're talking about influencing through the ministries, influencing policy, creating institutional change that has long term impacts, but it also is dealing with the, you know, the future labor pool and the and uh, agri agribusiness practices of the young people like in, in Cambodia is a very youthful population. Um, you know, and also this project, we're, we're guided by principles of equity and inclusion. And so we have a particular focus on, on different groups like uh, different uh, gender and youth as, as different groups. And with, with groups, we recognize that there's different barriers. Um, barriers to participation that vary across groups. Um, it's different if you're engaging with agriculture, it's different if you're young or old or male and female. And so thinking about these different groups uh, makes a, addressing their challenges, uh, coming up with unique, uh, unique solutions for their unique challenges. Um, so our project activities are are meant to be inclusive and co-designed with the participants to help promote both women's empowerment and youth engagement. You know, part of the reason is to, two thirds of women's employment um, in 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 Cambodia is in agriculture, and so even you know compared to male farmers uh, who tend to be concentrated in rice. Um, female farmers are more likely to be in charge of subsistence crops, uh, particularly vegetables and fruits. But this reduces women's access to income generation opportunities, um, but it presents opportunities to increase specifically the revenue of women if we invest in um, vegetable value chains. Another feature of the Cambodian population, like I mentioned, is that the labor market is based on a lot of very young people. There's a youth bulge, if you will. and over 70% of the population is under the age of 35. Um, and so you have this very large youth sector and not all of them want to be involved in agriculture. And there's a lot of rural to urban migration. It's very high amongst young people. And that can cause longer term labor shortages and, and that can create um, difficulties with economic opportunities uh, and, and long term prosperity for village communities. So in general, we expect um, to generate uh, applied and generalizable results. So we can apply them to Cambodia, but also to just the Southeast Asia region in general. Um, we anticipate engaging a high level of youth and female farmers, um, particularly under the private sector engagement pathway. We want to engage uh, over 11 educational institutions and help them adopt and apply new curriculum train multiple young people in graduate degrees, training the next generation to be the, the lead researchers. Uh, we anticipate training instructors at high schools, particularly about youth development and, and pedagogy and STEM education. Uh, we want to extend these three technologies we've been talking about um, and, and extend them throughout the life of the project and, and out into, into the wider Cambodian context. Um, we're going to produce a bunch of research outputs, including extension um, information and bulletins, uh, hopefully some policy briefs to help address uh, institutional changes at the government levels, of course, journal articles, and even some group, uh, some packages of curriculum uh, for the schools. And we're going to work with partners to consult and, and, and develop on revising uh, some of the policies for, for helping to, to scale up sustainable intensification technologies across all of Southeast Asia. So having, you know, partners in the Philippines and folks in Thailand and so hopefully working across the region to, to try to help um, extend the reach of, of this scaling activity. Um, so at the end of the day, we're hoping, like I said, to reach over 10,000 rice based farmers um, and, you know, directly impact over 1000 households and uh, benefiting farmers as they adopt technologies and improve the land in which they're farming. So obviously progress toward these indicators are going to be measured using different tools and surveys and on-site measurement. 
And data collected and analyzed by the project will be managed in accordance with the policies of the Institutional Review Board of the University of Tennessee and in compliance with USAID and all of the SIL requirements. Um, obviously, the collection, storage, and dissemination of data is going to protect the identity of people. Um, and we'll clean up the data sets that we gather, and they will be made, made available like phase one through the SIL Dataverse and the USAID Development Data Library. CSANE, which is our center of excellence in Cambodia, also serves as a repository of information, uh, particularly about best practices in agriculture in Cambodia. And so we're hoping to increase the capacity of CSANE to manage the data and information that are gathered by all projects in, in Cambodia. Um, and of course, all of our lectures and workshops and trainings and things we try to have recorded um, and, and shared and, and, and stored via, via CSANE. Um, and so last but not least, I want to acknowledge all of our partners that we're working with. Um, specifically on this next phase, we're working with the Royal University of Agriculture and CSANE, particularly His Excellency, Dr. Lita Hook. Um, also, Manny Reyes is helping based in Kansas. Um, we have the, the National University of Batambang. They just changed their name instead of just the University of Batambang. Now it's the National University of Batambang. Um, and some folks there also collaborating phase one still with Penn State and Dr. Ricky Bates and a graduate, uh, Cambodian graduate stu student, Neri Huat. Um, we're working also this time with Tennessee State University, uh, Matthew Blair, who is a, a plant scientist there that's got some um, great work looking at some of the same species of cover crops that they're looking at in Cambodia. Of course, CRAD with Florent and his great team, um, and then Swiss contact Rajiv and his team and we're all on, on our project. And of course, a couple of, a couple of folks here at the University of Tennessee. Um, we wanna thank them for all of the hard work already and so the, the ongoing stuff that they're doing now um, and also recognize a couple of the other groups that we're, we're partnering with peripherally, um, including like Echo Asia in Thailand and Circa in the Philippines, hoping to provide a, a larger regional, regional impact. Um, so thank you very much.